All right, now joining us on Tennis Channel Inside In, very pleased to be having this person as a guest. He's reached two major finals and a career high of number four in the world. Has uh, a ton of accolades, but maybe the most impressive thing is staying involved in the game and doing his part to make the generations after him keep going and keep improving and progressing the sport. Todd Martin joins us now. Todd, pleasure to have you on the show. Really appreciate you taking time to chat with me. Thanks, Mitch. Nice to be here. I'll start with uh, a lot of different ways we can take this, but I want to start with this because I'm similar Midwest roots. So I have to start from there. And uh, your, your origin story starts in the Chicago suburbs. You went up to Michigan and then back to Chicago for college. But what was it? What was the uh, universal force that got you to playing tennis and then playing it at a high level? What caused you to first pick up that racket? So I spent, um, uh, I spent a good bit of time uh, up until the age of 10 in Ohio, actually, in mm. Northeast Ohio. My dad worked for Goodyear in Akron, and um, my parents were both athletic. My mom uh, uh, had, a, had her master's in phys ed, and um, my dad was a, you know, sort of a traditional Midwest football, basketball, baseball, high school guy, and they found that tennis was the best way for them to enjoy recreation together. And as a tyke, I'd chase them up to the park. My dad sawed a wood racket in half. Uh, that's all they had back in the day. Um, so, so sawed one in half. And if I behaved myself as they were playing, uh, I'd get to play home run derby for you know a few minutes afterwards. And just, I, I fell, I mean, I was, I fell in love with basically every sport that I tried. <laughs> um, at, at an early age, basketball and tennis, the most distinctly so, but tennis was something, um, uh, and we had a, um, we had a very slanted driveway. So a basketball rim was, um, not easy to imagine coming by. Um, but like my parents, just because, just to keep me occupied, my parents turned a picnic table up on its end, and I just tap balls against the picnic table when I was home. That was more fun than playing with matchbox cars or whatever. And so, you know, I just sort of got the sound of racket hit ball, ball hit ground in my um, in my head pretty early. Well, I'm nodding along because I got the Northeast Ohio roots too. So that was your, your All right. part there. Yeah. With the football family and everything. Um, did you, in, in your time that you grew up, did you have you know, influences outside? Cause you were coming up in the tennis boom, the, the era where tennis kind of got mainstream at, at what point I should say, did you start looking to the media and the famous tennis players as kind of role models and ways to kind of follow that path? Well, I, when I was young, um, you know, the, the people who were on TV were, um, and we got to watch the Americans more than anybody else, but uh, Chris Everett, uh, Jimmy Connors, John McEnroe. Um, and then as, um, as I got a little bit more familiar and a little bit more exposure to um, uh, the at the time the modern game uh i started looking at um and this is probably after i moved to michigan when i was 10 and so uh that was when i would have looked at uh, McEnroe, connors lendl borg mm. um and a little bit later than edberg and becker uh mm. and edberg was the only one that let's say it was sort of lock, stock, and barrel for me. Um, aggressive game style, um, very composed uh, and, you know, gentlemanly or, uh, mm -hmm. you know, high, high levels of sportsmanship. Um, that, there was a lot there. And yeah. probably a good bit of it was my parents saying, see, look at that guy. See how he behaves? You should be more like him. Um, but, uh, I, the, the older four, um, Connors, Borg, McEnroe, and Lundell, I, I picked and choose, uh, uh, what I wanted to be out of those. So I wanted the tenacity of Connors more than anything else. I wanted the tenacity of Connors. I wanted the ice water through the veins like Borg. Um, 
I would have died for a work ethic like Lendl. Um, and uh, we were all envious of, uh, of John's talent. And so I, you know, I sort of pieced myself together, or pieced a model of my, for my game uh, together across those four. Um, and then certainly Boris and Stefan's um, success in the mid eighties, mid to late eighties um, certainly helped, um, you know, they were, um, they were a, a distinctly more modern right. style of play. Uh, you know, the racket progression, uh, the racket technology progression there uh, definitely made them play the game differently. The hands at the net with Macaro, no one really had those, but I mean, that style of play was very similar. And I wanted to just kind of segue into your style of play has been described. And, and I've noticed as well as very smooth, very sharp coming forward a lot. When did you develop your own style? When did you decide at what point in your career, this is how I'm going to play. This might give me the best shot to win and have success. So from an, uh, from an early age um, in Ohio, and then even more so in Michigan, I was taught really, really well. So I, I was taught a very traditional style of, uh, uh, or technique. Um, and uh, because I was a string bean, super tall, uncoordinated in a way, good hands, but uncoordinated, um, uh, holistically between my uh, my legs and my upper body, um, movement was a constant, and so I was I was educated um, or held accountable for my movement uh, by coach all the time. And so by the time I actually matured physically, I had great strokes. Um, yeah. I had the disciplines of good movement. I didn't have the athleticism of good movement, but I had the disciplines of good movement. Uh, and um, ar around 13, 14, uh, my coach uh, really started hammering into my head that I was going to, if I was going to be successful in tennis in the long term, I was going to finish most points at the net. And um, at the time, I didn't know how to volley very well. Um, at the time, I, uh, it was hard for me to keep the ball in play long enough to have the opportunity to come to the net. And at the, and at the time, I certainly didn't have the athleticism to cover the net very, um, um, very, very well. Uh, but the fact that that vision was laid early and the, the efforts, the disciplines were um, uh, were instilled in me to pursue that, uh, I think got me to the point where when I did actually start to coordinate my body and had the musculature to do so, uh, piece, the, those pieces of the puzzle uh, fell into place pretty quickly. When you play that way, and I know we're kind of jumping ahead, but how do you stay, how do you keep your spirits high, your morale high? when you are going to get past, when you are playing against players that are going to hit winners against you. Some, I think it's fair to say, aren't able to keep their head in it and would kind of go south pretty quickly if that happens. How are you able to accept the fact that, okay, winners are going to happen, but it still gives me the best chance to win? So I'll go in, I'll probably go in reverse order on, um, from, a, from a reason standpoint. One, uh, I lost enough along the way um, I was not a great junior. I was a good junior. I, you know, national rankings in my second year of age groups, you know, but nothing to write home to mom about. Um, so I lost a lot. I mean, I lost in, in the boys 14 and under uh, national indoors. I lost O and O and it wasn't that close. Um, so, um, so Francisco Montana's listing. Uh, hey, Kiko. Um, the, uh, that's the first, re that's the first reason or the last reason. The second reason is my coach constantly instilled in me that it was not an objective to be great today. It's an objective to be great 10 years from now. Like okay. there's no sense in trying, trying to be your best at age 14. 
I was, I was determined to be my best, at least in college and ideally after, uh, ideally after college. Uh, and then that's the second most important. And the first most important is my, my parents. My parents raised me to be a um, respectful and responsible uh, person. And embedded in that is the notion that we're providing you, we the parents are providing you this opportunity, this privilege to play a, a game you treat it with the utmost of respect. And if you treat it with respect, you try no more, no matter what you keep, you figure out how to keep your chin up no matter what. Um, and I think all of that sort of manifests itself in the ability to withstand, um, with, with, <laughs> withstand, you know, the shrapnel that is constantly right. um, embedded in your chest when the when, when you're losing uh, points in a row, um, it feel it always feels like you're losing more when you're coming than that. It might be yeah. right there. Yeah. You lose quick, right? You lose quick. So, oh my gosh, what would have happened had I not? It sounds like in your story of not being the best junior, still a very good junior, but not at that ultra elite level that it was always college. Like you didn't have that debate of, I might go pro early. College was the the breeding ground. And at the time, I know college's level has gotten pretty good again. It dipped a little bit after you, but you were riding the tail end of some really good college players that turned pro. Uh, college tennis was, uh, I, I thought was really, um, was really good when I was there um, at, at Northwestern. Um, I, I, one of the reasons I didn't go to the University of Michigan was because I was concerned in my freshman year I was going to play as low as number four in the lineup. And, um, you know, that, that, that tells you right there how strong, yeah. um, how strong college tennis can be. And, um, and I was so far away, Mitch, from being remotely ready to play professionally. I was, I was just not, I was just not good enough. I was not mature enough physically. I was, certainly was not mature enough uh, emotionally. And, um, and it would have been, it would have been, um, it would have been a failed experiment had I considered not going to college. I left college after my sophomore year and I, two years in and I, uh, two years into the, my professional career, I thought it was a failed experience. Mm -hmm. Uh, or experiment. I fortunately discovered that um, I was making more progress than I would, than I'd given right. myself credit for. That maturity is such a huge part. Obviously, the game development is huge, but for athletes that go pro early and aren't ready for it to handle the grind of a pro of a pro career, you mentioned those two years that you went to college and then pro. Before the breakthrough happened, before all the success started to happen, what were those first few years like on tour? Did you feel a sense of I guess loneliness, like it maybe turned tennis into a job instead of the the fun exercise that it was. What were those first couple of years on tour like? Well, the first the 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 first most difficult thing was leaving um, an extraordinarily comfortable place. Um, college was outstanding, right? Um, amongst a team um growing have the safety of that community but also establishing more and more independence and surrounded by thousands upon thousands of people in my age group and many of whom were uh, were and still are some of my best friends so um that was uh, that's a hard way to start a journey uh, it's uh, to to be leaving something so important to uh, to you behind. Mm -hmm. uh, that that's a very difficult way to start a journey. Um, my tennis was sporadically adequate um, those first couple of years. I'd have a good result, feel like I was making progress, and then just got throttled by some bad result or revelation that I. That I didn't know how to play the game as well as I had thought. 
Um, you know, whether that for a couple of months have another good result, okay result. And, um, but it just, it, it felt like a real slog. And I did feel um, there was a lot that I enjoyed about that time. Um, social, I, sorry, I should say socially was really difficult too, right? I'm, I'm a 20 year old, 21 year old in a, in a population of 25 year olds that did feel like a significant age gap. Um, I was not terribly outgoing, so it wasn't like I was going to inject myself into, um, the social dynamic on tour. So it, it relied on me actually to have some success as a player in order to be, um, accepted by the, um, by the population. Um, and yeah, I mean, I, it just, I, I don't know if it ever felt like a job. However, it did feel, and I remember this sensation um, vividly, it did feel like the game was different hmm. because there was more riding on it. Yeah. So I now had to support myself. It was no longer about winning for my college team or mom and dad take me to a junior tournament and mm -hmm. if I do well, that's great. If I don't do well, that's fine. Mm -hmm. I had no idea how large the check was that they had to write to pay for the travel, pay for the hotel, you know, but all of a sudden you're like, whoa, wait a second. I just lost in the first round again. And right. um, I know how much I spent and I know how much I made. And those numbers are in the mm -hmm. inverted uh, order that they should be. More with Todd Martin here on Tennis Channel Inside In. Uh, well, 94 is when it all came together. And uh, it started with Australia, the run to the finals. You made two other semis at majors. I guess starting off, did you have inklings that you were getting close going into the start of 94, that you were on the verge of something special? You still you well, did have a pretty good 93 with a lot of match wins there. But what was that progress of the feeling of getting closer like for you? Yeah, for me, 93 was the key um so i i did horribly in australia in 93 um i came back i switched back to an old racket um, that i had just switched away from um i had done a lot of physical training the end of 92 i actually stopped competing in 92 early so that i could have a longer off season that was a very you know, sort of my first revelation about strategic decisions um having long-term payoff. Uh, and then in February of 93, I had um, my first um, really sustained week of great tennis, and that was in mm. Memphis. I beat David Wheaton, Yako Elting, Andre Agassi, and Michael Chang before losing to Jim Courier 7-6 uh, in the third set in yeah. the final. And so, um, and I don't remember many results very well, but that one I remember. Um, gotcha, yeah. uh, and then a couple months later, or, yeah, I won a tournament. And so I think in that year, I probably went from somewhere around 100 to somewhere in the top 15 in 93. So when I got to 94 and having, and having benefited from learning from my previous off season, I, I knew I was ready. I knew I was ready to compete in 94. It's still, you don't really know until you get into the swing of things and a couple of things fall your way. It, it takes a lot of good luck. Um, it I think it takes a lot of good luck for anybody who's not um, one of the greats of all time to get into mm -hmm. that, uh, yeah. into those later rounds. I think it just, it didn't take luck for Pete or Andre or Jim to get into the, into the finals of a, uh, of a slam. Uh, it took, it took luck for me to do that. Not a, you know, a lot of good tennis, but a, Not you know, a, luck. <laughs> a good, a good, a bit, a good bit of fortune as well. And it was impressive that the one, the first result, the final of the Australian open wasn't the plateau. It wasn't like we see so many players make their first breakthrough and then the dip happens. You followed it up that year. Losses to Sampras, Sampras, Agassi, the two finals and the final in 99 was Agassi as well. When you look back at your best major runs that 
kind of met their match and some of the greatest players of all time. Do you look back at that with a different perspective now that you maybe got as far as you think you could have, you lost to two of the icons in tennis history, or is there still something left on the table in your mind? Uh, well, there's, I'm 52. I can barely walk and there's nothing left on the table. <laughs> um, so, gotcha. um, no, listen, Mitch, it's, um, I, I look at, um, I look at my, um, I look at the Americans that I was looking up to, um, who are my age peers, Michael Chang, Jim Courier, Andre Agassi, and Pete Sampras. Um, and sure, I could say, I, I, um, I took it in the chin from a, from those guys an awful lot uh, over the course of my career. And had it not been for them, I would have been, you know, mm -hmm. on top of Mount Everest. Um, if anybody believes that, um, we need to really have a chat <laughs> because um, I, I benefited more in spite of, in spite of losing to them, I, ben I benefited more from um, their presence than I could have ever imagined. Um, I won from a motivation standpoint, like that's greatness. So at least I know what greatness is and I can work towards that. Yeah. Um, and I did have, and I did have a front seat, um, especially, uh, with Jim, uh, cause we shared a coach and especially with Pete, cause we were, uh, we were close and we played doubles a, a good bit together and, and yeah. so forth. So I knew what it was and that gave me. I think that gave me a tremendous advantage uh, against so many of my peers uh, because I had a, I had a, I had a closer look. Um, uh, and the other thing is um, again, sort of to my nature as a, as a person, I'm not remarkably outgoing and I'm, I, and I was less so then. And so for me uh, in old school, traditional media, the only media I ever got was good media. It was, if I did well, people were patting me on the back. If I didn't do well, they were talking about Pete, Andre, Jim, and Michael. And, um, and I don't know if my ego had it in, in, uh, in it to withstand the scrutiny that, right. um, that their lives and careers were under. You hear a lot about what you said, that that great perspective when players that play in this big three era, now that Federer is retired with Nadal and Djokovic, they've collected all the slams. And it could be easy to say if I was just born in a different era, but as you said, I got to believe they're much better players for having been pushed by what greatness looks like. Is there anything you can, you can shed about any of these players, what it was like to actually share the court with them? You lived out what a lot of us watched what makes Pete and Andre and, and Jim Courier for that as well? What made them so tough to play against as competitors and also as tennis players? Um, yeah. Um, I, I think the, I, I think first and foremost, there was a tremendous amount of self-belief and it didn't always reveal itself as self-belief. I think um, Jim uh, Jim looked determined. Uh, Pete looked relaxed. Andre looked talented and flashy. But when, you know, the second half of uh, of Andre's career, when he was really quite focused, uh, I think he had established he had he had. I've never seen somebody transform themselves like like Andre and. Um, he shed so many of what were probably insecurities um, about himself and about his game. Uh, and um, what, what resulted was a, a tremendously high level of self, uh, self belief. And yeah. when you walked out on the court with him, or, sorry, I should say, when I walked out on the court with him, I had a sense of how much self belief he had. When I watched him walk out on the court with Pete, maybe I didn't see that same self-belief. When Pete walked out on the court against anybody, you sort of knew, like, yeah, that, that guy knows he's going to win. He didn't always win, but that guy knows he's going to win. And um, um, and I think that's the, 
uh, that, that might be the difference between people feeling um, sorry for themselves about having to compete against greatness and those who penetrate right. that, that echelon and, um, and start to see greatness. Like uh, Daniil Medvedev mm. uh, of this, uh, well, I guess of the somewhat younger population now, considering what, uh, how young the guys are that are having good success now, yeah. Um, but I mean, Daniil Medvedev uh, clearly has a level of self-belief and um, and and had he not, no matter how good of a player he is, he wouldn't have figured out how to penetrate that uh, yeah. that 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 uh, stratosphere. Yeah, you don't have a level of belief if you're not able. I mean, being able to beat Djokovic going for a career grand slam, you have to have some confidence there. Remarkable stuff. And, and I, I know that there's the household name American tennis players, but you were doing your part as well, carrying the mantle on all those Davis Cup teams. I think nine straight, the 95 team. What was it like, not only just representing your country, Todd, but also getting to be teammates with some of these iconic tennis players? It had to feel, I guess you had to have some perspective in the moment. Like this is a pretty unique experience to become teammates with, as we mentioned, some of the greatest players of all time. I don't know if, um, you know, we grow up watching, for us, it was growing up watching McEnroe and Fleming and, you know, having these, uh, these Davis Cup experience, uh, experiences um, or visuals embedded in our minds. Uh, as accomplished as Pete and Andre and Jim and Michael were, I... I probably still had McEnroe and Fleming up here because I was eight to 15, not, not their age peers. And so like, I, I knew these guys as my peers and friends and, and, and essentially teammates. Um, whereas John and Peter were still sort of like, Oh, that's, that's McEnroe Fleming. That's pretty cool. Um, and um, so, I, you know, that that element, there wasn't like the sense of moment. And part of that probably also came from the notion that we weren't we weren't we weren't really together as a team. I mean, it was these four sporadic weeks uh, around the uh, around the calendar. It could be Pete, Mal Washington. And a doubles team one one match. It could be Jim, me, and a doubles team another match. It could be Andre. Like it was all over the map, right. and so it it didn't feel like a team as much as it felt like uh, we were competing as individuals. But we had the benefit of being able to compete for the USA. Um, uh, yeah, no, that that totally makes sense. I think it's a luxury to have when you have such uh, a deep talent pool, which you had at the time. And uh, I, I do want to mention as well, the record that you do have still a share of, but it's been tied and caught up on, but the nine grand slam comebacks down two sets. I think Federer and Murray got you Federer retired. So props to Roger for not breaking that one last record, but nine, two sets comebacks in grand slams is a, uh, is an insanely high number. There's some good players on that list. Carlos Moya, Greg Gruzetsky. What do you think it was that I guess gave you the comfort, calmness, if you will, to still be in these matches and mentally checked in to give yourself a chance where probably some luck and some fortune has to happen, but that you still had that sense of belief down two sets. Yeah. Um, so I don't, I don't remember how old I was the first time I came back from two sets to love down and Honestly, I don't know if I lost from two sets to love up first or if I came back and won from two sets to love down first. I mean, yeah. but the fact of the matter is we've spent we would have spent so many years competing in our sport as little kids, as adolescents and then young adults. Um, OK, we lost the first set. What do you do? You keep playing You like, yeah. you know. I might play better. My opponent might play worse. Like that, that just, so because, because it's five best of five sets and because that deficit is two sets, 
I, I do think that it is more, it has the potential of being more discouraging. However, I, I mean, most best of five set matches are at one point in time, two sets to one, I believe. I believe more set, more matches go four and five sets collectively then go three sets, yeah. uh, right? I don't, I don't know that for a fact, but I believe that's probably, believe, yeah. that's probably the case. So that means the majority of matches at one point in time are two sets to one for somebody. Would you rather be up two sets to one? Sorry, would you rather be down two sets to one having lost the, thought, lost the third set or be down two sets to one having won the third set? Yeah, I mean, I think I know where you're going at getting that. Yeah, I mean, it's how, how many times do we see the top players in the game where they're down two sets and you say they have to win it? Basically, you have to win it in three because of Djokovic or Nadal get momentum and then here, here it comes. I, I would just add to it too in, in judging your career, studying it a little bit. You had a, a you knew who you were as a tennis player. You were going to, like you said, going back to how your parents taught you to play and yeah. compete you knew how you were going to play and you didn't deviate from that regardless of how bad it got. And of course you're not always going to come back, but you always have that belief that it is possible. I just got to keep putting in the work. Um, yeah. If uh, I lost and if I, if I lose when I'm up two sets to love, I have two options. One, to believe that I'm the unluckiest human being alive because yeah. I lost from two sets to love up. Or it's human nature. And the same thing can happen to my opponent the next time they're up two sets to love. Um, that's, that's, the, that's just life. I mean, that's just life. And you, you figure out how to get up the next morning. You tackle the next challenge. And for me, that third set was the next challenge. Uh, and most of the time you recognize um, either one of two things, you either had a lot of room to improve because you played the first two sets poorly or the, or your opponent had played the first two sets exceptionally well. Well, it's hard to play three sets exceptionally well. So let's, let's see what he's got, you know, and just sort of ask, the, uh, ask the question. Well, some of those matches were at the U S open, some of the notable ones and much is said about the crowd as an American who lived it. Did you feel that boost? Did you feel that extra surge of energy as an American playing in the home slam? Yeah, it was great. It was great. It was, um, uh, there is, um, for being a relatively mild mannered athlete, um, there was something about playing at Ash Stadium um, under the lights, especially where um, you know the New York the New York sports fan demanded more. Mm. They they participated in the competition. If you're not playing well, they jeer you, whistle, chirp, and then. If you were playing well, they'd like, yeah, I'll take me along for the ride. And um, and that, uh, frankly, that stimulated more enthusiasm and energy um, in myself. Yeah, I saw the racket smash when you beat Moya. It's like something came over you, and, and I believe it. It was phenomenal stuff. Uh, a few more things with Todd Martin here on Tennis Channel Inside In. Even before your career winded down, Todd, you were – active in the ATP players council, you were taking on different roles, helping the game. And did you see yourself taking these leadership roles naturally, or did it just get kind of thrust upon you? Because it's no coincidence in my mind, what that has led to in your post tennis playing career. Well, I'm thankful that, um, uh, I'm, I'm thankful that let's say I was the one person not smart enough to step backwards when they said, who wants to be the president of the, of the player council? I was the youngest person on the player council, I think, when I first was elected as president. Um, and it really was, I mean, it really was sort of like, you know, I got, I got pointed at. Um, at the time, I, I was the best player out of the group. I, I had been an interested party just 
I don't know. Um, it was my career. I figured if if I took the on court stuff seriously, I should take the off court stuff seriously. I wasn't at all interested in 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 the business side of the sport, other than to understand right. you know, what what are the responsibilities on players, what um, you know what what's going on, how does this how does this system all work? Um, but then I, I did enjoy. I enjoyed spending time with uh, uh, with the leaders of the ATP. I enjoyed spending time uh, with um, fellow players who had an interest in the sport beyond just chasing the ball around. And um, you know, this led to that, that led to this. And, um, uh, and then uh, eventually, um, I think more through serving on the USTA board of directors, uh, it, it became more and more apparent that my contributions to the game, if they were going to sustain, were going to be off the court. I didn't have great experiences coaching the game. And so um, uh, the notion of, uh, of converting my career off the court and into the office. Um, yeah, it, it was, um, it was, it was an interesting leap. Um, and, and, and not one that, um, I did with any great certainty of success and very similar to actually playing in, in a way. <laughs> well, it's been a remarkable one, uh, completing up this year, your tenure at the international tennis hall of fame, growing that the classes that have been great. And, and I think it was a fitting tribute that the last a uh, Hall of Fame Open that you presided over was won by Maxim Cressy, playing your style of play somewhat. So uh, I think that was good. And I think, you know, helping improve the game and kind of push it forward, it seems like it is something that has been up your alley. And I just, I don't know if it strikes you this way, but it seems like you're somebody that maybe not, didn't necessarily know what they wanted to do, but definitely wanted to stay involved in the game post tennis playing. So, so for me, I, um, the compelling, uh, the compelling draw to come and work for the Hall of Fame in 2014 was the notion of how much have I taken from the sport, and what what can I give what can I give back to the sport, and um, uh, and I did feel like um, serving the Hall of Fame, serving the history of the sport, but serving the history of the sport in hopes of um, being a uh, being a vehicle to help grow the sport, I thought it was a great was a, a great opportunity, a huge challenge, and um, and something worth. Uh, uh, as my wife would have said at the time, a life uh, a, a worthy life adventure. Like you know, it it might have ended in failure, but at the same time, like it's worth it's worth a go. And um, uh, and I've. I've uh, thoroughly enjoyed my almost nine years and um, I'll shed a couple of tears uh, in December as I'm locking up my office for the last time. Well, I, I think it's, it's very noble what you've done, the ability to grow not only the game, the hall of fame, but, you know, put Newport on the map a little bit. Uh, the last thing I wanted to ask you about is uh, your extensive charity work. Um, you know, the Todd Martin youth leadership, uh, one of them being to kind of help, you know, underprivileged, under-resourced youth. So important in a lot of ways, tennis can be a vehicle, which we've seen time and time again, but how important was charity work to you in general? And then starting the youth foundation to help kids first and foremost. Um, so again, I'll blame my parents, right? I, um, I think our, our philanthropic spirits are developed for the most part, for most of us, are developed pretty early in life by um, what do we witness our parents doing uh, first and foremost, and then um, and then uh, what are they supporting um, financially if they have the means to do so? Um, so with that and a childhood tennis coach who I've spoken about today, who. Um, uh, was um, still is actually a a vehicle for good in our sport, um, 
and you know he connected dots he's the most manipulative human being i know who i love dearly but he just said, you know, you really like kids and you always talk about how important your hometown of Lansing, Michigan is and tennis and and you know how much tennis is already given you given you. This is after um, I made it to the quarterfinals in 1993 at Wimbledon. So that was sort of my first good six month uh, stretch of tennis. And he said, there's a way to do this. And he told me the story about Charlie Passerell, Arthur Ashe, and Sheridan Snyder coming up with the NJTL concept, uh, now National Junior Tennis and, and Learning. And he said, we can do that here and we can provide kids the opportunity to have uh, privilege that your parents provided you, their families don't know how to provide them or are unable to provide them that and we can do good. And um, uh, between uh, him, my dad, and um, a little bit of me, uh, we created this. Uh, we created this nonprofit in 1993 that's still going. Um, it's scary to think that it's almost 30 years, but um, um, you know we've we've evolved from essentially teaching tennis. Uh, 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 tennis camps in the summer to a couple or 300 kids uh, on, on, on community courts to, you know, tennis leadership, tons of tutoring and homework help, um, giving kids physical education in lieu of what they're missing at, uh, yeah. uh, in school, uh, any number of things. And we're, we're serving thousands of kids annually now. Um, and I've had, you know, I was, I was part of the seed that started the started the deal. I'm still dedicated to the um, to the program, but much to um, much 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 to my um, joy, uh, it's become a community led awesome. uh, program. And once it once it became that, it was clear that it can be sustainable, and that's um, that 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 means the world to me. Very remarkable stuff. Uh, Todd Martin, it's been a pleasure a pleasure chatting with you here on Tennis Channel Inside In. Uh, you know, we got a lot going on in the future. Best of luck with that. It, it's really been an honor talking to you. And I guess the last thing, are you becoming a tennis parent now? Are you on the other side, your kids playing? So our kids are 19, 16, and 14, and all at one point in time had tennis rackets in their hands and all don't any longer. Um uh, yeah, they've all found their own passions, fortunately, and um, uh, I do imagine that at least one of them, and hopefully all three, will find tennis again in their yeah. adulthood. It's uh, uh, the the joy of it is for all of us. I mean, and this goes for those of us who actually played the game well um, professionally. Um, it is the sport of a lifetime, so um, I'm excited. I'm excited to. Uh, uh, hopefully see them on the court again um, before too long. This has been a blast. Thank you, Todd Martin, so much for coming on Tennis Channel Inside and Really appreciate it. Thanks a bunch, Mitch. Nice to talk to you.